Have you ever had an experience with another Christian or with a church where maybe you felt like they were gatekeeping you? Maybe you felt like they were saying, this is what you have to believe to be a part of our community or to follow Jesus. Um, you know, we have a phrase we use nowadays called gatekeeping. That's where we kind of, you know, keep our uh, values and ideals and things to ourselves. And we really kind of like prevent people from joining our community, uh, whether that's a community that likes cooking or CrossFit or any number of things, right? You can gatekeep any kind of community. In our sermon today, we're going to talk about uh, a, a, a time during the Gospel of John where Jesus said, I am the gate. And, you know, many people have taken that to be a really exclusive thing that Jesus said, almost that Jesus was gatekeeping uh, who could be a Christian or not. But in this message from our senior pastor, McGray de Vega, McGray is going to unpack this a little bit more to make it be something that can be a bit more accessible, actually not a way that Jesus is gatekeeping, but a way that Jesus is opening the gate for us to have a relationship with him, anybody to have a relationship with him. So if you've ever been burned by the church or maybe gatekeeped by the church, you're going to want to check out this message. Message. Let's pray together. O oh God, open our eyes and ears to empathy, curiosity, and humility, that we might be generous and compassionate toward others and ourselves. Amen. When Jesus called himself the door or the gate, we understand what he's saying in a way. When it comes to our homes, we expect certain people to enter our houses through certain doors. If someone comes in through the front door, that person may be a guest, someone to welcome into our homes. If someone comes in through the garage door, that person is likely a family member. If someone comes in through the back door, that person is probably an uninvited guest. And these are not hard and fast rules. We live in all kinds of homes, but the general principle is true. We expect certain people to enter through certain doors. And that's why on one level, we can understand when Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. By comparing himself to a door or a gate, Jesus set up a dichotomy between two different kinds of influences on our lives. One influence leads us to life and peace, and another enters to steal and destroy. Now, the question for us this morning is, which influence will we allow into our lives? Which door will we choose to open? You may remember the game show, Let's Make a Deal. It debuted on television in 1963 and aired for 30 years and was rebooted back in 2009. Its original host was a fellow named Monty Hall, who would offer contestants a chance at taking home the contents of whatever was behind the door that they chose. And depending on their selection, they would go home with either a fabulous prize or a comical dud. You can watch clips of classic episodes online. One clip I watched had a man and a woman trying to decide between taking whatever was in Monty Hall's backpack or choosing whatever was behind doors one, two, or three. They passed on the backpack, which contained $1,000 cash. They passed on door number one. It was a motorcycle valued at $1,400. This was the 60s, remember? Then they passed on door number two, a hot tub and a year's supply of ramen noodles, valued at $3,400. Instead, they chose door number three. It was a child's tricycle with a trailer attachment and a stuffed teddy bear. Wah, wah. Wouldn't that game show have been a whole lot easier if contestants could have had x-ray vision? at least gotten a sneak peek at what was behind the doors to help them make a choice? Sure it would have, but that's not the way the game worked, and that's not how life works. In a way, the show Let's Make a Deal was a metaphor for life. It reminded us that we can't forecast the future. We don't know what is behind the doors of the choices we make, but each of those choices do have consequences. Who we choose to be today has direct impact on the kind of people we will be tomorrow. 
and the kinds of influences that we allow into our lives will impact the kinds of temptations and struggles or triumphs and rewards that we will reap in the future. And that's why Jesus' words are so compelling today. He said, I am the door. I am the gate for these sheep. He reminded the disciples that the stakes of choosing which door to open in life are much, much higher than ramen noodles or tricycle trailers. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Contestants, behind door number one is life, real life, abundant, free, hopeful, and healthy. That's the kind of life God created and intended for us. That's, that's the kind of life Jesus came to give us, abundant life. But behind door number two is the thief, the unwelcomed guest. Which does beg the question, what did Jesus mean by the word thief? Now, some in John's day would have understood the thief to be false teachers. These would have been people whose beliefs were not in line with what the church would eventually consider right theology. So one idea from biblical scholars is that John was calling these heretics thieves, and he was warning the early Christians to stay in line. There's another popular notion that thief refers to Satan. No surprise, right? I mean, the Bible often identifies Satan or the devil as the source of all things evil. That's how we have fanciful imagery of a literal demonic figure sneaking around up to no good, tempting us, teasing us, taking advantage of us. Now, whether thief originally referred to false teachers or the devil, I'd suggest that either option is too limiting because in the broadest sense, Jesus would have us be wary of anything that would distract us from receiving the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. The threats are much greater than simply wrong belief, and the evils are much greater than just one personified demonic character. The thieves in our lives are anything, any influence that blocks the free flow of God's love in and through us. It is anything that prevents us from experiencing the forgiveness, the freedom, and the joy of God's image alive and well in us. It's anything that keeps us from living the abundant life. So I'd ask you the question, what are the thieves in your life, in the words of Jesus, that threaten to sneak in and steal and destroy you? Perhaps the thief in your life is a brokenness in your relationship with others and a failure both to forgive and to be forgiven. Maybe that thief is a constant worry about your future, an anxiety about your job, your security, your family, your finances, or life in general. Maybe your thief is a nagging addiction to activities and substances that are damaging to your health. Maybe your thief is death itself, Maybe you're struggling with acknowledging your own mortality and that wrestling is preventing you from living life rather than simply avoiding death. What is your thief? What is behind your door number two? And wouldn't it be nice to know which door is which? Wouldn't it be nice to have x-ray vision to know in any given moment which is door number one and which is door number two? Well, it turns out there is, and it's not about x-ray vision. It's not about eyesight. It's about hearing. It's not about being able to see the future. It's about hearing the voice of Jesus. Hear these words again. Jesus said, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. 
It's not about being able to see the future to know what choices to make. It's about hearing the voice of Jesus. In the Netherlands in 1986, there was a 19-year-old young man named Mark Van Kampen. Like many young people, Mark had reached a crossroads in his life, a period of self-discovery in who he was and what he believed. He was wrestling over matters of faith and whether to believe in Jesus and the precepts of Christianity or choose the growing secular path of agnosticism. In other words, which door to choose? Mark had an uncle whom he loved, Uncle Henry. Henry was a Catholic priest and he loved his nephew very much and he wanted to provide spiritual guidance for young Mark, which Mark welcomed. So Henry and Mark began a conversation via letter writing that would span the course of months. Henry would share his thoughts on Christianity and Mark would respond with more questions. That uncle was the great Henri Nouwen, one of the most profound writers on the Christian faith in our lifetimes, sometimes referred to as the Mr. Rogers of the spiritual life. Nouwen collected those exchanges with Mark and turned them into a book titled Letters to Mark About Jesus, which if you've not read it, I would commend to you as a beautiful primer on the Christian faith, written with extraordinary beauty and clarity and love. In the very last letter he sent to Mark, Henri Nouwen encouraged him that as he struggled with belief and doubt and faith, he needed to lean in and listen to Jesus. And he gave him three ways to hear God's voice in his life. He wrote to Mark, quote, how can we keep listening to this voice in a world which does its best to distract us and get our attention for seemingly more urgent matters? In this last letter, I want to put before you, by way of a conclusion, three forms of listening that for me have proven to be the most productive. First of all, Nowen said, listen to the church. He said the church isn't always popular, Sometimes it seems more of an obstacle, but Henri Nouwen said, quote, I am deeply convinced that the greatest spiritual danger of our times is the separation of Jesus from the church. The church is the body of the Lord. So Nouwen encouraged Mark to attend worship, to be in community, to participate in the life of the church more fully. It's good advice. Second, to listen to Jesus, Nouwen said, Listen to the Bible. Read the scriptures. Read books about the Bible. Read about our spiritual ancestors. And not just read the Bible, now and said, quote, allow the Bible to read you. Don't read it simply to gain information, as if we were trying to own the Bible, he said. Let it shape your thoughts, your actions, your relationships with others. Finally, to listen to Jesus, now and said, Listen to your heart. It is there that Jesus speaks most intimately to you, which leads to one of Nouwen's greatest quotes on prayer. Quote, Prayer is first and foremost listening to Jesus, who dwells in the very depths of your heart. He doesn't shout. He doesn't thrust himself upon you. His voice is an unassuming voice, very nearly a whisper, the voice of a gentle love. Whatever you do with your life, go on listening to the voice of Jesus in your heart. You need to set aside some time every day for this act of listening to Jesus, if only for 10 minutes, he said. 10 minutes each day for Jesus alone can bring about a radical change in your life, unquote. Now and said, these three ways will guide you to an ever-deepening spiritual life. In the words of Monty Hall, they will help you know which doors to open to find the greatest treasure, life as God intends for you. And in the words of John's gospel, listening to the voice of Jesus will give you life, a life more abundant than you can imagine. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for your constant care and guidance in our lives. Open our ears and attune them to your voice. Silence all noises within us, but the sound of your voice, that we may navigate the choices and hardships that we face. Replace our fear with courage and the deafness of our pride with an open humility. Help us to fling open the door to our heart and welcome you in. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for listening to this message today. I've got two things I want to tell you about. One, uh, down in the uh, notes below are some next steps that you can take if you want to take this message deeper, including some reflection questions. And then second, uh, this Gospel of John, it can be really complex, and these I am statements can be really weird metaphors to understand and digest. Back in 2020, we did a podcast going through the entire Bible, and we had two episodes on the Gospel of John. If you go into a podcast app and search The Bible Project 2020, not the Bible Project, which is a whole other thing, but the Bible Project 2020, you'll find a podcast that we did over the year 2020 going through the entire Bible. And there's two episodes on the Gospel of John uh, by the Dr. Amanda Propes Renaud and Dr. Susan Hyland. I highly encourage you to check those out. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.